welcome to pratidwani where we try to humanize science i'm your host chivi pawan kumar it is my pleasure to introduce you to my guest on this episode dibyendu nandi dibyendu is a professor at uh, indian institute of science education and research kolkata and he also heads uh, center for of excellence in space sciences which is also part of uh, icer kolkata his research interest is our star sun Uh, he's a solar astrophysicist and also a kind of space weatherman notably his research on sunspots and underlying magneto hydrodynamics is fascinating he's also been involved in the aditya l1 mission which was uh, launched uh, to reach the uh, lagrange point uh, between earth and the sun and this launch happened very recently as you may be aware of in this episode we discussed his biography how he got interested in science his career trajectory from kolkata to indian institute of science bangalore to montana usa and then back to kolkata at uh, icer uh, where he is now the professor we had an elaborate discussion on science education how to approach physics as a discipline and astrophysics as a sub discipline now uh, we discussed his fascinating research on sun solar astrophysics sun spots magneto hydrodynamics and many other things related to his work dibyendu also describes his collaboration with the uh, indian space research organization isro on the aditya l1 mission he beautifully describes his launch day experience and uh, it's really worth uh, listening to dibyendu also articulated his thoughts on the state of uh, science research and education in india and how it can be improved uh, in 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 various different uh, ways we also have a short segment in bengali about his motivations and uh, research interest so do listen to that particular part too overall it was a very engaging conversation and i thoroughly enjoyed the discussion with dibendu i know him uh, for over a decade or so now and i always felt that any discussion with him was uh, not only engaging but also very educational uh, this discussion of course was no exception to that particular viewpoint and i'm very sure all of you will uh, uh, enjoy this particular conversation this is pratidwani where we try to humanize science with dibyendu nandi i am delighted to have dandi our friend from uh, isa kolkata he has been one of the you know most uh, enthusiastic researchers i've ever come across uh, dandi welcome to pratidwani Uh, good morning, Pawan. It's a pleasure uh, to be on your show. I've known you for a long time since mm-hmm. we've been sort of uh, in different dizes in two other sides of the country. Uh, yes, yes. Uh, this is a wonderful, wonderful podcast that you have been hosting for some time, and uh, it's my honor to be with you today. My my pleasure and honor, actually. Yeah. So, uh, uh, Dandi. We, uh, by the way, uh, for listeners, uh, we call uh, Dibyendu as uh, Dandi. He's uh, known all over <laughs> among our our circles as Dandi. and uh, that is the name we actually stick to in this particular podcast so dandy tell us a little bit about your uh, childhood how you became interested in science and uh, and the background behind uh, you becoming a scientist well so i was uh, it's kind of a checkered childhood i was born in jamshedpur which was then in bihar now it's in jharkhand huh? yes um, yes my grandfather was actually the superintendent of mines for the tatas in fact he discovered a mine known as uh, shukhinda mines so my parents from my father's side all of them sort of grew up uh, this big place in jamshedpur and somehow when my mother was was about to have me you know she was asked to come lock stock and barrel to jamshedpur you could this kind of <laughs> lineage and everything there uh, to deliver me so i was born in jamshedpur <laughs> Uh, and then uh, my Wonderful. grandfather had moved to uh, to a place called Balasore in Orissa actually so uh, a lot of bengalis uh-huh. had settled um, near a place called Remuna uh, so my father ended up eventually working in the the agricultural department of the government of Orissa um, so uh, in in the in the you know for most of his career so in fact uh, i spent my childhood in this place called Balasore uh, a small town Uh, hmm. kind of nice few houses open fields uh, and close to chandipur on sea from where um, you you have this defense facility there the proof facility from where agnis yeah yeah uh, are sent out so uh, so yeah so i mean um, so my childhood was spent there uh, had a lot of fun i didn't i hated going to school by the way 
Uh, I used to apparently jump off from the rickshaw while going to school often and come back uh, all okay. bloody back to the back to the house. It was difficult <laughs> to get me to school. Um, then when I was in class, uh, I remember that year very well. It was 1984. Uh, I remember that year very well because as soon as yeah. I mean that was I think just a few months before we came came to Calcutta, um, we moved to Calcutta. My father transferred to the West Bengal government. Uh, we settled down in Calcutta. Um, and I joined school in class four or five, I don't quite remember. Uh, that was the year that Indira Gandhi was assassinated. I remember that year yes. very much. I usually am very bad. My memory is very bad. But this one I remember. Mm. Uh, that was soon after we had moved to Calcutta, actually. Um, so anyway, so the rest of the schooling was in Calcutta. Um, we, uh, my parents had settled down here. My father was still moving around doing doing uh, sort of this jobs in various parts of the state. Uh, my mm-hmm. mother sort mm-hmm. of uh, brought me up pretty much on her own, I would say. Uh, you know, I mean, until I was like, yeah, in, in, in school, um, high school. Then I moved to no. St. Xavier's College um, for my BSc uh, mm. in physics. In fact, I must tell you, I was very confused. And you know, people would laugh at me. My friends would laugh at me if they hear this. I was very confused about whether I'm going to do chemistry or physics. Um, wow, I ended up, okay. I ended up uh, doing <laughs> chemistry in, in presidency college for a month. Um, uh, uh, but then I left because I, I didn't want to. I, I somehow I just figured out in that one month that no, chemistry is not for me. And I left mm-hmm. and went to St. Xavier's College to do physics because presidency may... Um, I was in the long list. I didn't make the first list of, of uh, physics uh, in presidency. And the rever- I think I was fifth or something in the wedding list. I never, never really got there. So I ditched presidency, nice. which is kind of a strange thing at that time. I mean, and I went to St. Xavier's uh, through, I first was in Vidya Shagar for a month and then went to uh, St. Xavier's eventually to do physics. Um, mm-hmm. And then I just, there's no looking back. I mean, I realized that this is it, really. Wonderful. Uh, so okay. I think a lot of people now kind of, you know, when... I mean, I see this in many new generations. They kind of, you know, they, they know what they're going to do. Or at least they're very confident very early on. I never was. I was always very, very confused. Uh, so anyway, so finally it fell in place that I want to do physics in my bachelor's time. Um, nice. <laughs> and then I was the kind of, you know, when after the bachelor's, we were writing exams in various places for getting in for either master's or IPhD. Um, and then I got through to, to ISC for the IP, that seemed like the best option of uh, whatever mm-hmm. I had. Um, and so I ended up doing my my master's and PhD in ISC. And I must also tell you, I was very confused about, I mean, not confused, I didn't really think very hard about it. What am I going to do when I mm-hmm. do my mm-hmm. PhD? Right? Um, uh, so nowadays, you have a lot of students who in the first year, second year, they were kind of decide, I'm going to do this, right? Um, yes. I'm in awe of the students and I'm also not sure this is the right thing at this stage in the first year that you decide I'm going to do this specifically. So, mm-hmm. I mean, I, you know, so when the time came after my master's, like one year of my master's to kind of talk to everybody, figure out what I want to do. I talked to a lot of people. It's more of an elimination game, a more, mm-hmm. more, right? Because a lot of things were interesting um, and often people sort of influence you, right? So you talk to people yes. that are influenced by a person, Um who's doing something and then it's a mix of influence of the person and the field, right? Uh, in some ways. Um, and also sometimes you just don't like certain other things that's going on. So you end up mm-hmm. doing something that seems to be the best option amongst everything, right? So I would say it is a mix of all of this um, mm-hmm. through which I ended up doing doing astrophysics, uh, particularly magnetohydrodynamics uh, applied nice. to the sun, solar magnetohydrodynamics. And uh, here I am. Wonderful. Wonderful. Yeah. Absolutely fantastic. See, one of the issues uh, is that when you act, are growing up, uh, if you have a reasonably good exposure to uh, science, you are generally in a situation where you end up being confused <laughs> because uh, you see that the beauty of science actually is not restricted to only one particular discipline. Correct. Exactly, And probably, is that one of the reasons why you could not make up your mind? Because this is actually a very common problem. In fact, personally, I, I too had similar kind of things, especially between uh, uh, astrophysics and optics and other things. Yeah, Somehow yeah, it yeah. also uh, went ahead. I mean, so I come from Bengal originally. So uh-huh. if you're a Bengali, then, uh, then, then uh, and somehow you end up doing physics, then 
you yeah. want to do one of two things either cosmology or particle physics you kind yes. of you know you line up 100 bengalis and you know when <laughs> sort of random throw random stone hits a random person you go ask them i think 90% of the time you'll get this answer like cosmology or particle physics right um i think to a large extent that's also because like you know i think bengal is uh, generally read a lot of yes random yes. stuff science books this that and and they get influenced by good right it's, it's so happened traditionally there are a lot of lot of stuff have been written about certain fields mm. right just because mm. it's sort of perhaps easier to 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 kind of i don't know get your head around them grasp them or you see them out there you, you come out in the night and you can't escape the cosmos this kind of staring at you right absolutely uh, it's large scale it's out there right so um, i think that's one of the reasons that kind of influences people i tell tell undergrads now that don't get influenced mm. by a book like a brief history of time and think that mm. that is what i'm going to do right because that's completely misleading right i mean it's uh, it can get very hard right i mean <laughs> cosmology is extremely i mean it's a difficult field if you want to do well right mm. you have to be very well trained pedagogically mathematically it's not it's not a book in a popular science book that should influence you uh to think that you're capable of doing this or this is what is written you know in your in your sort of well uh, ironically starts right <laughs> so um i discourage if you ask me today i discourage people from making a choice very early i tell people yep. you know go through most of your bachelors you know give equal weightage to all the all the different topics keep your mind open mm-hmm. uh and don't worry about the tools i mean don't think of i want to do computation i want to do data analysis i want to do theory because tools are tools right think of what would give you happiness in terms of research topic and the rest the skills you should pick up and there should finally a match between the skills and the interest because otherwise it's not going to work out right absolutely uh, so yes. i think for me it was i think the other way around in the sense i i picked up i, I was basically a physicist complete physicist mm-hmm. i was learning a lot of different things I was looking mm-hmm. at different skills I was picking up different skills and then I sort of at the end I came to the topics finally at the end of it mm-hmm. and there was a lot of mm-hmm. things I could in principle do right mm-hmm. and then I sort of thought and said thought that okay these are the skills I have I feel comfortable with those skills and I, I feel comfortable applying those skills in in this two three different fields and this is one of the fields that also attracts me so let mm-hmm. me just mm-hmm. get into that right and and solar astrophysics is not really at the time that we were doing solar astrophysics i want to tell you the story because i think it's interesting right yes so yes this, yeah this is very famous journal called astrophysical journal right or astronomy yes, and yeah. astrophysics um uh, this is like this two astrophysical journal is that is published by the american astronomical society uh, so it's like the american journal and the astronomy astrophysics journal is published by the europeans mm-hmm. the europeans mm-hmm. would always publish in ana and the americans would mm-hmm. always publish in apch and we don't have our own journal so we should kind of yes kind of fight to kind of get through to one of those journals nice okay. so many of these journals it's solar physics the topic that i'm working on mm. like there was a hierarchy right so there would be like all the yeah. subjects topics did come first okay uh-huh. things like cosmology there's that um, mm. uh, astroparticle physics gal- mm. you know mm. gal- extra galactic physics solar physics would come at the end uh, and then planetary physics okay uh-huh. at, mm-hmm. absolutely at that um i think that the 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 reasoning being that you know i mean okay this this planetary shit like you know the solar shit really is sun is there. <laughs> we've done this forever right i mean that we are just immersed in the planet the sun has been there i mean we have been studying this for a while because it's like the nearest thing to study so it should be very easy so we have finished everything that we need to know about this this topic so let's just relegate them to the back of mm-hmm. of this mm-hmm. journal right so i was told by a lot of people that you're making a bad choice wow uh, okay okay but the point is i don't know how i mean i don't know what it was for you um but i know it's different from the, for this generation but during our time we were not making choices thinking about okay is this a good choice in terms of what is going to happen after 10 years am i going to get a job absolutely uh, i absolutely. didn't i didn't think along those lines at all <laughs> same um, here same here right so i just <laughs> did what felt right for me to do at that point in time and i ended up doing absolutely. solar physics and well i published a science paper from i see hmm. there was the first science paper from the physics department i think in a, in more than a decade doing Wonderful. solar physics which is hmm. supposedly at that point in time was the worst of the astrophysics topics to be to be doing you know to for somebody <laughs> to be doing in principle right and now suddenly of course it's become very hot because of space weather yeah. and and so on yeah. and so forth right 
But this is the whole point. I mean, you see, so I ended up in a field where at one point in time, it was considered to be the least preferable of one of the things to be, to, for somebody to be doing. And, Wonderful. and now through a cycle, somehow it's, it's suddenly people have discovered that it's extremely important for, for, for modulating the near space environment and affecting our technologies, uh, which is a learning that happened over the last couple of decades. And suddenly it's mm-hmm. like, mm-hmm. you know, I mean, everybody is, is talking about it. So my point is, don't take these decisions based on what is hot, what is not, because these are cycles that go through, and you can make a topic hot by your own contributions. Your own, absolutely. Yeah, that's important, absolutely. I think, uh, for people to realize. I think just do it, what you feel like feels right for you, instead of thinking to, overthinking this too much. Overthinking. Because after all, we are scientists, and we have that leverage to some extent, right? Absolutely correct. Absolutely correct. In fact, for for listeners, you know, Dandy's uh, paper was on explanation of uh, uh, some specific distribution of sunspots uh, uh, in a specific kind of a flow environment on 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 sun, of ah, course. It looks like uh, you're right. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, I did my homework. <laughs> yeah, yeah, interesting. Yeah, yeah. No, because uh, 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 what is what is important? In fact, we we're going to expand a little bit more later on. But uh, Dandy, this is very specific and important point. What you really emphasize is that uh, the fact that you have an open-ended kind of uh, a viewpoint up to even a PhD stage actually gives you uh, a lot of room for uh, creativity, right? Because there is a benefit. It's not just only about uh, really creating an opportunity, but there's also a creative aspect because you are now exposed to various different parts of physics exactly. or any other branches of sciences. And therefore, you can add into or bring in that particular... Uh, treasure trove, so to speak, into your play, and you'd be able to uh, utilize them, right? Yeah, I think that's very important, and also the fact that I was in a in a traditional physics department in in yeah, ISC, yeah, and um, yeah. there were all these talks going on. There was like two astrophysicists in the whole department, and as you know, I mean, uh, during our times, that was a condensed matter heavy department, the very famous yes. condensed matter physics, yeah, very, very right? famous. Yes, and we yes. all these condensed matter talks going on all the time, and of, of course, was like, I mean, we, we get used to only going for our talks, right? Topics in our mm, topic. Mm, mm. I think I, I for a long time I made an effort to go to every damn colloquium that was happening in the physics department. Mm, that was very mm. important in a, in a lot of ways for for my my. I'm not saying I'm I'm therefore I'm an expert in every different field in physics. I'm not right, but still, I mean, I can you know I appreciate what is. You know what's the exciting stuff that's happening in other fields. Uh, I I have talking points, um, and in general, my eyes are open, and I'm more, you know, I'm more re- more relaxed around people who are not doing my stuff, nice. uh, and I'm interested nice. in what they're doing. And I think mm, that's something mm. that's very important because when you lose that, you sort of, you know, I mean, as you said, I mean, often we end up doing science uh, in isolation and and uh, within the confines of our own knowledge. It was not never meant to be like that. Right, uh, and so if you are open to to challenging yourself, to figuring out what what the hell is going around in your boundary condition, you know, around your boundary, mm. Mm. and open mm. to that, I think it you're open to more you know exciting tools, methods, ideas that's happening uh, around you in other fields, and you can assimilate them. And more importantly, you end up becoming a good communicator, where you're comfortable talking to people across various um, domains, which I think is fundamentally important for any student. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, yeah, I mean, I think that it's important that as a student, um, and I keep on telling this to my PhD students, that that go Mm. for other talks. I mean, Mm. it's very, Mm. very important. I mean, not just astro talks, but go for other talks. I mean, I wish I had the time where I could go to every talk that's happening. I I somehow (laughs) cannot manage that anymore. Yeah, uh, but yeah. I really benefited from it, uh, and I still do manage to go for talks, um, uh, even random talks. Like day for yesterday, there was a talk by uh, Nobu Mondol from TIFR. No, yes, yeah, famous, nice, famous nice. particle physicist. Retired long back. Yeah. You know what yes, he did yeah. at seventy-two? He decided he's retired. He's living in Calcutta. Yes. At seventy-two, he decided to go to Himalayas. Himalayas, yes, yes. space camp, right? He trained for a couple of years, and he gave a talk on on this whole expedition of of going to absolutely space fantastic. camp. Yeah. And it was an evening talk. I, I, it was one of the best talks I've heard in a long time. I thoroughly enjoyed it. And it's, it was so yes. inspirational for somebody like yes. me who's just you know, about to get to 50, right? Mm. Uh, this guy <laughs> at 72 is like reinventing himself. Yeah, uh, yeah. Yeah. He's not given up on life, uh, finding some new adventures, new challenges. Uh, that, that's pretty cool. I mean, that's, that's uh, a... so it, was, it was nice. And so I came back 
excited about my own science my own life and, and stuff like that <laughs> i went mean, to school right exactly you know the fact that uh, you derive only scientific aspects from an interaction is a limited way of looking at the whole thing you are enriching yourself far more than just mere getting some particular ideas and uh, probably that is also uh, the value of uh, an interaction right because uh, yeah. you end up getting so much out of out of such kind of exposure in fact uh, i would also want to kind of touch upon a, a specific point uh, part of your education more so from your uh, your your uh, house and your parents uh, kind of viewpoint so what was it like uh, growing up in house uh, because uh, for for somebody to become a scientist at some point of time uh, voluntarily or involuntarily there is some role of your local environment which will uh, enable you to think and also be observant uh, what was it like growing up in your home okay so um well so in the house as i said my father had this transferable job and he was often on uh-huh. different uh-huh. places so he just was a kind of a strict kind of person he would just worry about okay am i studying or not it uh-huh. was it's not so important for him in what i am studying i mean i had to study and do well in my exams i think that was uh-huh. that was like the typical like and there's a typical middle class average sort of motivation for most families i think right yeah, yeah. and my mother was most of the time uh, like working hard to keep 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 the fire rolling and the fire <laughs> rolling. and things like this so i mean um so yeah so i mean we are pretty i think uh, you know i mean i would say very much in the like the, the middle class average kind of family where 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 everybody was worried about their child being adequate mm-hmm. and ensured mm-hmm. that uh, that you know i at least get into a room with my books uh, you know yeah. I mean, that's about it um you know to 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 ensure that i sit down and study uh, and so if i don't do well in exams i would get kind of a scolding from them if i do well mm, so mm, yeah good mm. but but not necessarily beyond that but okay so if you're growing up this is also very cultural i think if you're growing up in bengal um yes yes there is already a peer pressure and this is where mm. i think uh, i think a lot of common in some communities is there i, I don't know when i have heard that even in the malali community some is something similar that, that there's a lot of lot of sort of the culturally you you want your 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 students your, your children to to do higher studies right to go as yeah, much as yeah. they can right yeah. um so that peer pressure was already there in in bengal mm, that everybody mm, was studying yeah. everybody wanted to kind of learn something get a, get a degree um and get you know if possible get get a master's degree and things like this right i mean yeah, it's kind yeah. of weird and i it's weird to the point that i don't necessarily agree with this philosophy i think bengali sort of would rather have somebody with a higher degree but earning less money mm. uh, then then prefer somebody who has no degrees and earning a lot of money not right? of money. yeah uh, and i think that has held back bengalis because i think that has not produced many entrepreneurs uh, in bengal mm. we have mm. produced mm. a lot of people who are bookish who mm. are sort of you know, intellectual in the sense they know a lot and can have a decent conversation about you about you know starting from world history to to mao zedong to you know um uh, to the second world war to, mm. to the bengal famine uh, to literature and arts but uh, <laughs> we have not produced many entrepreneurs right so i i sort of have a different philosophy there anyway uh, but keeping that aside i think there is always a um kind of a i think background pressure for everybody to be studying <laughs> and well so hard study so so that's the environment i think look within the 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 family within within my home there was i don't think there was anything greater than okay you have to study and do well but mm-hmm. in the larger society in the in the times i was growing up there was certainly um uh, a feeling that that if you do higher studies you know it's it's, it's good for you mm-hmm. and you should you should like you know certainly at least go into a masters masters degree or something masters like. yeah so that about in my extended family i had a lot of school teachers who were mm. uh, you know educators so uh, many of my aunts were for example uh, school teachers uh, so education was generally valued in the in the you know in the extended family anyway mm. uh, so uh, so there was no question that if i wanted to do higher studies there would there was no question that i would be stopped from doing higher studies i mean Uh, in fact that is certainly encouraged as i said it's certainly encouraged more encouraged than making money so mm, mm. 
um so so i would say that that um i never really was uh, uh, i mean i was not really into studies until class 8 or 9 i think um finally i think around very late i think i sort of everything fell in place and i sort of started liking doing stuff and studying so mm. i think um and it was only when i was doing my bachelor's physics that i really mm. started mm. really loving what i was doing loving yes uh, so that also one would say that you know i mean that i was just kind of a the average guy until then i think this mm. you know, and so in terms of studies and everything mm. so but in, in in bachelor's is where i really bloomed uh, that's mm. where I, everything fell in place finally uh, wonderful so yeah. wonderful yeah this is uh, this is something which is very important uh, because uh, the perception of somebody having a very great track record ever since their childhood is not a prerequisite to somebody becoming a scientist in yeah, fact that is something I, which we yeah, generally absolutely. have to emphasize and uh, because of the fact as you mentioned there is so much of peer pressure nowadays on on children uh, i think they may have to chill out a little bit <laughs> exactly <laughs> to, to take it easy <laughs> and then yeah. uh, look at it <laughs> look at uh, uh, how how things are going yeah that's important Yeah, I mean, I don't think you need to have a stellar academic record. You have to be first, second, third, or something like that to be doing academics. Mm. I think that is completely, uh, I think, it's very, very misleading. In fact, I often find, often find that people who have not necessarily done be- very well uh, in their courses suddenly blossom when they are in research. Absolutely, uh, absolutely. Uh, which, which happens? I think it's important that you do have a very, you know. reasonably good awareness of the field you are working in and you have certainly mm. pick up the tools that mm. you need to use uh, to advance in your research topic i think those are very very important but you don't necessarily get to the top of the class and and things like this i think it's just uh, i mean yeah so very very like, very clear yeah. yeah like people who are who have spent some time exploring the world around them beyond academia mm. or had some adventures mm. uh, mm. have done reasonably well more than people yeah, who are very bookish and have got like the 9.8 or things like this so yeah yeah the more interesting people in my mind so yeah. absolutely absolutely so i want to also touch upon uh, one more aspect which you did emphasize in the passing is the uh, the culture in which you grew up which is uh, essentially uh, bengali uh, because i think you most of your childhood was spent in kolkata if i'm correct after yes, the jamshedpur that's correct. i think that is correct. see the uh, with with all the kind of caveats of uh, uh, the uh, entrepreneurship etc uh, bengal still actually has that uh, great kind of culture of uh, having value for science you know that is something uh, if you take a, a kind of generalized aspect across the country i think that is probably one of the positive elements i would see in the, in the bengali culture where people are still interested in science there is value for people who are educated i'm not talking about only the degrees but people who are knowledgeable in fact uh, if you if you look at uh, other places uh, this value is not that uh, is not that much uh, for example i grew up in bangalore and uh, people were uh, laughing at me that i was doing bsc <laughs> having also quit yeah and i having quit engineering and then doing bsc oh, yeah. that is that's even, even worse even, that's even yeah. worse and uh, that is something which is still not uh, prevalent i i think it might be changing even in bengal but that has a deeper kind of uh, resonance with people who value science and you know the history speaks for itself if you look at the kind of people who have emerged out of that kind of environment we owe a lot of our development in terms of scientific thinking to a lot of people from that kind of environment so how how does one have to balance this out this is a very important point what you also mentioned because there is actually a dearth of people who are entrepreneurial uh, entrepreneurial spirit is very important i'm no way actually you know demeaning that part of it at all but how does one balance uh, the, uh, how how does one really bring in this semblance uh, in this yeah i think um, yeah unfortunately you know you have to talk a little bit of politics without really getting into mm-hmm. the details of it because i think yeah um, i think it's not just for bengal but certainly true of bengal that there were a lot of thinkers who were very you know who were forward looking creative mm-hmm. who were mm-hmm. good scientists good philosophers and you can take any number of names 
like let's talk the chemist apc roy acharya mm. profula chandra yeah, right? yeah yeah fantastic scientist fantastic fantastic entrepreneur institution builder right mm. Mm. um jagdish chandra bos we had we yes. had uh, uh, magna shah ashen bos they were more more like more academicians but mm. jagdish mm. chandra uh, jesse bos then um, then apc roy were were all around the people right? all right absolutely um, absolutely it is also true that in those times i i mean possibly in bengal maybe also in other places uh these people were valued they were part of the intelligentsia um uh, they and our politicians were were aware of of what is what needs to be done mm-hmm. uh, in order to have a region a state or a country come up i think that's uh, that's important i think that awareness and that this bridge between the thinkers and uh, mm. the politicians are important right you cannot really neglect them because they absolutely. are fundamentally absolutely. important for a country for a region for a state right but there needs to be a bridge between mm. the politicians who are leading the country um and uh, the scientists the philosophers the thinkers the intellectuals mm. who who are have been traditionally for for a long time for over ages have been thinking about what what you know making sense of the world around them and and thinking about what is the right way to move forward in order for a society mm. for a culture for humanity to 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 do better right mm, mm. Uh, when there is a disconnect things start breaking down mm, mm. In the bengal that you talked about that that is the the golden age the renaissance mm, period mm. right is the the early 1900s to yeah, to i yeah. would say like even up to maybe 50s 60s right and then things started breaking down mm, um, mm. the politics went haywire uh, at some point in time in bengal and i don't want to go into details or specifics of it but i don't think we have recovered mm. from them that mm. disconnect mm. still exists there is no bridge between our scientists um mm. and uh, the true impartial unbiased intellectuals and the government anymore mm. Mm. it's the other way around you are part if you are part of a party or a government then you are a scientist in their eyes or an intellectual no. in their eyes right mm. 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 um to some extent true everywhere not just in bengal right i would say that yeah. even Absolutely. across india is true and i think that's wrong right yes it yes. should really be the other way around other way around absolutely right absolutely. if you are good in what you do right then the government the 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 doers the politicians of the country should should reach out to you right and and engage with you uh, i i think actually we got it up i don't really like talking politics in public or even mention which is you brought it up i think it's fundamentally important that there is a bridge which always exists between the intelligentsia of a country and the government absolutely of irrespective absolutely. of whoever is in power right power uh, you Precisely. know which of our color i don't care i think there has to be a bridge if that bridge is broken the country will go down if that bridge remains mm. broken for a long period of time over decades that country mm. will fall i think bengal is a very nice example of that mm. right mm. we still have people yes we still produce good scientists good students where are they bowan mm. there around in your own institute in pune <laughs> they're, they're yeah. there in isc right <laughs> there in iits yeah. they are they're there outside of the country right yeah. Yeah. um but there are very few who who are back in bengal uh, contributing to the growth of bengal right yeah, um, yeah. also eventually see i am sitting in a nationally funded institution like you are right mm, mm. Uh, but if you look at the state government colleges uh, mm, mm. well so so the less said the better right mm, uh, absolutely and this is a tragedy because bengal had a you know had a very good ecosystem it, of of education it's a shame fantastic absolutely schools, fantastic schools absolutely. fantastic colleges right that's no longer there anymore because there is no money right if you mm. don't if you do not have the infrastructure if you do not collect enough taxes from enough activities going on money doesn't circulate in the ecosystem you can't build things you can't build things you can't have the infrastructure to 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 lure people in from different parts of the country to keep mm. uh, the people uh, or you know when who are good in your in your own state or give them opportunities to build something develop something so so as a result what has happened is industrialization in bengal has basically gone out of the door we have not progressed 
uh, I think I would be confidently saying you're not progressed in 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 mm-hmm. large scale industrialization in in thirty forty years or something like that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And that has that has resulted in in the state again. I think going down and very much. I think we are close to being bankrupt now. I mean, the roads are not 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 getting repaired. So this is sorry mm-hmm. state. So unless you strike that balance, where not only are you focusing on on basic education, you are also creating the opportunities within that region that you are in to ensure that once you have trained and educated a set of people, mm-hmm. you're giving them a line, nice, lovely playing ground with all the opportunities yeah. possible for them to play in your own. Yeah, absolutely. Right. Absolutely. absolutely. And then they start, start creating, creating revenue. They start building an ecosystem building. Of, of taxes coming in mm-hmm. uh, and the state does well. It pumps money back in, into education, into mm-hmm. healthcare, uh, um, these are fun and infrastructure, right? These are fundamentally important. The basic necessities, right? That that one one needs to have, right? Um, we have not done that uh, very effectively, I think, in this side of the country. Um, to some extent, I think this this criticism should also probably apply to to India as a to a large extent. Absolutely, also, right? absolutely. I mean, look at yeah. US. Not only has it created an ecosystem for people who are going through this higher education in their country to play in their own backyard, they've created an ecosystem where many of us... In the like, world. <laughs> right? Which exactly. we have done, by the way, many of yeah, us. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. So, uh, absolutely. so this, is, this is something that we really need to think hard about, not just Bengal, mm. but India. Uh, that uh, we are producing a lot of PhDs today. We're producing a lot of scientists. Um, so I think the best of them all go out and then mm, mm. many come back. Perhaps even I would say some of the best of them come back because it's very competitive, competitive, very hard to get a job in India, I think. Right? Yes, so, yes. But how much, right? If you produce 10 PhD students, you'll be lucky if three of them come back and get a job in India, right? Absolutely, absolutely. Right? Right. Yeah. So let's say right. 70%, I think even more perhaps, but 70% mm. of our PhDs probably stay somewhere. They either become faculty somewhere else or, you know, mm. work for some industry or, or remain as postdocs as scientists feeding mm. the international ecosystem, right, of research. Mm. Mm. Because it exists, right? Exactly. There is, there is. There is. We have not created that in India, right? Mm. We need to, mm. So therefore, we must also have entrepreneurs who need to create mm. an ecosystem where we can employ, uh, you know, where our students can be employed, right? Uh, so I think scientists should also be very excited about this approach that's coming up now about entrepreneurship and go out and get you know, do something and generate employment. I think that's important. Absolutely. I'm, th- I'm, I'm, tr- I'm, I'm going to try and do this. If I fail, I fail. But I want to try and do this. So that's why you know, I want to reinvent myself into this. Wonderful. Phase. I think it's important. I think it's very important uh, that people start thinking about it. Because you think about this yourself is- and you think about your own students. Um, in some sense, you, you're working hard, they're working hard, and then you're sort of producing them and you're saying, okay, here is the wide mm-hmm. view yonder, get out and swim, right? Mm-hmm. And they go away to other shores, right? But what are you doing in your own shore to get them back? Um, so I'm not saying you have to limit yourself to your own shore, but start small and then, you know, you can build up. But that's entrepreneurship and that's sort of been missing, I think, in, in Bengal, in our blood, Um and missing to a large extent in India compared to countries Absolutely. like that. Right? Absolutely. Correct. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think this is something we need to worry about. Be worry about. Be this is fact. something. Yes. Absolutely. Absolutely. In fact, see, this also kind of comes with an appreciation uh, of the fact that there is always a, 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 an economic viewpoint which is necessary for us to embed that in your in our own education. Not only as a discourse of, let's say, intellectual kind of uh, arguments or something like that, that uh, politics and economics has a very important role in everything we do, including science, right? It might not be explicit, but uh, it really plays a very critical role. Maybe also kind of, uh, you know, sensitizing our own research environments with these kind of aspects uh, will hopefully kind of bring things slightly to, to a better level. Yeah, I think and, it's, it's uh, actually very, very important. Uh, mm-hmm. You cannot... I mean, you can you can remain silent, mm-hmm. uh, but it's you cannot ignore it because it impacts politics and economics of a country. Impacts your science, uh, your, your productivity, your opportunities, right? Absolutely. And vice versa. Science impacts economics, eventually, you know, over a course of time. 
Absolutely. science would also impact politics because if you if science and technology would impact politics technology um, absolutely because if you empower your country you are empowering your politicians right uh, absolutely i mean think absolutely. of think of chandrayaan or mm, aditya mm. or the other missions mangala and mm. uh, astrosat all the missions you've done i mean at one end there is a science value to it there is some technological advances that that value is there but the perception value that's there uh for for young children for students of the country for mm-hmm. the perception of achievement for the nation as a whole bringing together you know um a very diverse set of people from across the nation uh to celebrate in this achievement uh the the empowerment that it gives to our leaders political leaders in term mm-hmm. in terms of a pride in terms of um, a, a talking point um when they meet other world leaders mm. right that actually has real value mm. Mm. right and that comes from science and technology i mean chandrayaan has not happened because of one year of investment in space science absolutely absolutely i want us to think about this hard i think it has happened because of i think 50 years of investment absolutely. in our space mm. program right mm. uh Yes, we have been late to to the moon, but you know we have we we gone there based on our own own yes right? yes uh, machines that we have produced mm. here in India, right? Uh, that's something I think uh, to think about for us for Absolutely. our politicians also. Absolutely, this is very well put. in fact this also emphasizes the point that uh, long term uh, thinking is such a crucial aspect. and uh, uh, if you look at the evolution of science itself over uh, centuries uh, things have happened uh, at at a pace which is generally beyond a uh, few generations right it doesn't uh, change is not very evident but there is always something positive which can really result out of investment in science and technology and uh, that's a crucial crucial aspect of it So I'm yeah, going to also yeah, yeah 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 you have something yeah please tell please yeah yeah but I, and the point is that you may invest uh, that investment cannot be very directed it's just you brought yeah. it up I want to make this point because I think this point mm. has to be made and if it's this is the living document I would rather that this point be made here mm. Uh, mm. I want to make this point as often as I can in various different fora that mm. often we get blinded by a certain hot field and I told you about mm. this hot field business when I was starting out right Yeah, but my yeah, own personal yeah. experience with the so-called hot and hot field, right? Mm-hmm. Cold field. So anyway, <laughs> uh, so often you see this directed cause where you ignore everything else, and mm. you put eighty percent or seventy percent of our money in in a basket that appears to be hot because the waste has been doing it suddenly, right? Mm. Mm. Uh, without realizing that we are perhaps a bit late on that bandwagon, and we don't have mm. the ecosystem to nurture that. um uh, so so even before creating that ecosystem we end up produce put, putting too much money in that pot at the expense let me make this clear at the expense of other sciences in the country mm-hmm. and we end up funding a lot of very average very poor scientists doing shit work and producing tons of useless papers in a certain mm-hmm. field just because that field is so called within quotes hot at the point in time mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. this is not right mm you have to spread your money out yes there will be directed um funding but that funding should you should be very careful and balance out in the sense making sure that you don't end up not funding other branches of science which in 10 20 years can end up producing something very hot absolutely right, right. absolutely uh, this is important balance out your your funding don't go after the the big wards that suddenly become very hot I'm not taking any names again here, uh, because the waste things is very hard, right? Absolutely, uh, the waste things is very hard because the waste has perfected those techniques, those methods have uh, pioneered those. They have the scientists, have the, the ecosystem to work on those, right? Think of what you can do that that produces something complementary that can still be mm, mm. considered hard. That is important, right? Uh, instead of always running behind ideas exactly. of others. Right, you you can set an agenda. The East, because China is also producing things which are which mm, are mm. not necessarily bad, pretty good, right? Mm. So why can't we, right? Um, Absolutely. So that's important to also keep in mind to balance this thinking, this funding out. 
that's a very important point what you're making. In fact, uh, it should not be a zero-sum game, as you are mentioning, because one need not actually have something at the cost of something else. And this has been a mistake in the past too, right? Because if you look at uh, uh, the kind of uh, things which have happened in terms of the investment in science and technology I'm not right from the beginning. I'm not talking about the yeah. current last five yeah. years. I'm talking exactly. about years. I'm talking of the last two decades, two, three decades. I think this is going on, right? Absolutely. Uh, unfortunately, you know, when some person who is or, or a group of people who have been in that field, who they think it's a hot field, have been controlling things, it's not mm. a good thing, I think. Uh, it has to be diversified. The portfolio of science funding has to be diversified in this country. That's important. Absolutely correct. Okay. Yeah, absolutely right. In fact, this is something also uh, which is going to take us to a slightly uh, kind of particular, uh, uh, you know, uh, conversation where I would want to also kind of get your views on uh, on on uh, kind of developing interests as you mentioned, see, there are a lot of uh, students, not only just students, even uh, uh, researchers who may want to actually switch gears or or take a deviation uh, where they are totally embedded in, in uh, basic sciences who would want to venture into, let's say, some kind of an entrepreneurial uh, viewpoint or some kind of a venture which can be a little bit more uh, over and above the academic uh, aspect of it. How does one go about uh, looking at this kind of uh, venture? How should one think uh, on such kind of processes? There is a lot of benefit and there is also a lot of encouragement per se. Of course, uh, there is always room for better investment, but at least the mindset is now open enough where you are not only valuing people who are bookish, as you mentioned, but people who would want to go out and do something. Uh, how does one kind of reorient if somebody w wants to do it? Because that is not a thing which yeah. is very easily uh, inculcated in our culture. Uh, if you right. want to just uh, elaborate a little bit more on that. Yeah, see, I mean, uh, well, so I, I, I'll talk about it, but hypothetical mm. in the sense that on what I think are, are, are things that one can possibly do. But with the caveat yeah. that I'm, of course, not an expert in this, mm. in mm. the sense I've not done it and succeeded, right? Mm. Uh, mm. There's no proof yet that I have done that, right? So, yeah, yeah, absolutely. But I'm an academic, so I'll, I'll come come at it from what can we do from within our academic system, right? Mm, mm. Um, well, so in this regard, I think the Ministry of Education probably is 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 one of the more forward looking institutions mm. in terms of entrepreneurship because I know I'm aware that somehow DST, DA, and other organizations have still not managed to come up with a coherent document allowing their scientists and their students to go ahead and. Uh, you know, be entrepreneurs and start their own companies. Well, the ministry has a very nice, I don't know if you've seen it, has a very, Minister of Education has a very nice document, mm, um, mm. Uh, which encourages entrepreneurship, allows a scientists, faculty, students to start companies, uh, lays out some guidelines. In, in fact, advisories to the institutions saying that if a faculty does it, consider mm. giving them a sabbatical uh, leave mm. to kind of nurture their companies and things like this, which I think is very, very nice, right? Mm, mm. Okay, so um, so so now that let's say that let's assume that this kind of a leverage is also given to scientists in DST institutions in DAE institutions. Um, one thing that you can certainly do is I'm not again I'm not saying that everybody needs to do this. This is important, absolutely. right? Absolutely, you're absolutely. hundred scientists in, in an institute. Somebody wants to do just pure simple analytics because of the beauty of the mathematics that he or she is doing. I think that's absolutely fine. He or she should not be pushed to do anything else. Right? Absolutely correct. It yeah. should be self. And I am interested in this. I, I would like to do this. I should have the leverage to do this. That's all I want. Abs in this institute, right? Absolutely right. Absolutely. So, I mean, yeah, a sabbatical year for a faculty. Uh, expand that horizon to, to mm. starting a company. Maybe uh, allow them to take, you know, maybe one course a year. Uh, mm. So that one semester is off so that they can work for the institution, writing papers, doing research, but also nurture their companies, right? For students, often, particularly in the ISER system, IIT systems, we have undergraduate projects, right? Mm. Mm. More often than not, those projects are very kind of, you know, pen and paper, computation, bookish in the lab, right? Uh, this is an argument yeah. that we've been having uh, mm. uh, in Isaac Kolkata, for example, that why can we not have a final year master's project, which mm. is purely you you tell the students, go start a company, mm. right? Mm. Your master's project is that experience mm. Mm. of going ahead, 
you know, if you're interested about a certain product, getting a certain product to the market, your experiences of, of, of trying to get it done, launch it. Even if it fails, it fails. That's the master project, right? It's the experience. Wonderful. Right? Wonderful. Um, unfortunately, we couldn't get it passed yet in the Senate. We just barely have had some discussions about it. Often mm. what happens mm. is the government doesn't get in the way. We get, get mm. in our own ways. It's our own ways. <laughs> right? Yeah. We create so many rules and guidelines <laughs> that we just completely mess up everything and get stuck in this own net that, you know, this net of guidelines that we produce for ourselves, right? Um, sometimes it just takes a brave leap into the wild. Mm. And uh, we are often scared of doing that. And somehow if you put 100 people in a room to take a decision, <laughs> it gets worse. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> you know... Uh, <laughs> Sometimes perhaps Kili. a good idea is to just get a, go ahead and do it. But this is a good way of doing it. You <laughs> Instead of a bookish project, an analytic project, or a conversational project, or a project in the lab. Yeah, lab, yes. But, but you know, b- developing something. Or maybe not yeah. even a product, a service. Right? Get out and do it. Launch a company. If it fails, it fails. Right? But if it succeeds, let's say we, we you know, we have across all the departments, we have some, you know, I mean, 250 students. If uh, even less than 10% of its up, 5% uh, mm. succeeds. Mm. We have about 12, 10, 12 companies, you know? I mean, so yeah. Yeah. that's better than what we have been doing. Doing That's yeah. progress, yeah. right? Absolutely. And Absolutely. we have all these mentors. We are there. We have a lot of skills. Institutions are hotbed of skills. Mm. You know, I mean, I, 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 have, I am developing the circle of friends uh, in the industry now in startup companies. Mm. And I keep mm. telling them, you know, you have this five different job profiles. You're advertising, you want this, this, this. You get one of our PE students, he or she mm. can actually do all the different five jobs. So pay them more to justify their PhD, the hard work they've done could get their PhD. But on the other hand, they have all the skills that you look for in five different people, right? Absolutely. One of them Absolutely. counts the skills. And more than that, they are creative. They're problem mm. solvers, right? So a, a random student that I would have would, would know to solve some differential equation, mathematical equations. They would know to, to Python programming. They would know. They would know data analysis. Mm. They would know how to put together a nice graph, a, a presentation, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. And to write a paper. And then they're, they're been trained to think creatively about solving a problem, about figuring out Absolutely. what a problem is, right? What problem exists or is worth doing and then solving it, right? Uh, this is a wonderful package, right? In in, in a human being. Uh, Absolutely. It's almost like Absolutely. magic walk, walking to you, right? I mean, so I think this is another thing that we doesn't happen very well in India. It happens in the US. It happens in Germany very well. Mm, mm. Industries hire PhDs. Yes, yes. In fact, this has that to, is an this important... This has to happen in India. This has to happen in India for our industrial sector to also do well. You know what? In fact, it's it's a very, very important point what you're mentioning because employability and also employment opportunities can really drive these things. In fact, so much so that uh, in in, uh, uh, about a few months ago, uh, there was a conference in Japan and uh, there was a a panel discussion which was happening as part of that particular conference. And uh, the main participants in the panel discussion were... uh, Optical Society of Korea, Optical Society of Taiwan, and uh, that of Japan. And the common theme they had actually was very interesting. In fact, the problem was that they could not hire PhDs because a lot of them out of their masters were getting employment opportunities to join industries. (laughs) In fact, they were telling that uh, in what way we can attract, make this more attractive such that students do come. And in fact, so much so that most of the people who are really employed there are mainly uh, Indians and Chinese students. Uh, in yeah. fact, you can see that, that that's where the gap is. And of course, our population is also quite large. So there'll right. always be a spillover. But the yeah. point what is uh, very interesting you made is that creating an ecosystem which would facilitate this kind of thinking. And uh, as you mentioned, sometimes the breaks are not coming externally. It is the internal friction which actually creates a lot of problem in, in going yeah, ahead. I think and too many it. rules. I mean, government yeah. institutions particularly. I mean, I you know sometimes you feel chained. I mean, you have to think about something. <laughs> and as you do it, you have to go take these ten permissions. Yeah. And often the problem is, I often find this that you know you have some dean sitting somewhere who should I give you a certain thing. It often boils down to his or her more often his. Mm. 
<laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, true, true. Prejudices, rather than mm. the ministry or the agency saying you can't do this, right? Mm. Mm. It's it becomes a human prejudice which stops you mm. from doing something, right? Which is local. I often find that the some of the rules. Okay, some can be pretty pretty nasty, but most are not actually. Most have enough leverage or enough gray zone to to help you interpret them creatively in a way that that mm-hmm. helps the institution. And when you help Absolutely. a faculty or student within the institutional setup, you're actually helping the institution, which a lot of people Absolutely. sort of hello miss out, right? Mm, mm, mm. <laughs> so, Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. Um, and often uh, you are stuck with with this local minimas, and that's a problem. Mm-hmm. I'm sure this happens in every institution. This is not every in institution. institution. Yeah. So, I, I agree with you. I agree with you. In fact, yeah. there is uh, there's always an issue. I, and uh, one of the important points we you also emphasized was that. it has to be an internal drive right because you don't want everybody to do only entrepreneurship in fact that is actually <laughs> fatal <laughs> yeah. yeah it's an other other extreme because oh, you can't absolutely. also have yeah. you cannot have a policy pushing everybody to go in in that particular viewpoint no that is, somebody that is, wants that to is absolutely yeah. stupid i would say right yeah yeah exactly, I mean, exactly. yeah that is absolutely stupid absolutely So uh, we're going to actually also touch upon few more points uh, related to, let's say, the evolution of a student, because this is exactly what kind of also helps anybody who wants to get into this. Is the fact that uh, in what way is our education really catering to such viewpoints or such kind of training? Uh, see, traditionally, for example, I and you all come from a, a physics background, and we teach physics uh, in our respective departments. Physics actually has rich history, but also it has enabled a lot of technology, uh, which is something which our students probably are not appreciating completely, because there is also an esoteric aspect, and more so, for example, a person who works in astrophysics and kind of space weather, etc. now things have really changed a lot in terms of the opportunities which are available if the student is now listening to this how should she or he be adapting their kind of viewpoints in being open ended not that they have to really make up their minds but uh, how does one let's say adapt uh, a basic science training to these kind of opportunities uh, what is your yeah. thought process i mean it's a double edged sword in the sense that mm. You see, uh, there are tons of problems in the education system itself, right? Which doesn't allow yeah. our students. Uh, I'm talking of school students here, maybe even yeah. first year, second year. I mean, the you know undergrad students also, undergrad college students, yeah. undergrad students as well. I mean, I'm, and I would think I would say that I mean I would blame our. I mean, not just blaming those schools, but I'm also blaming us to some extent. I think it's the everywhere. Mm-hmm. I think we 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 mm-hmm. straight jacket this too much. Absolutely. Um, okay. uh, I don't want to repeat what is already known, and people have talked about a lot that we somehow the Indian education system, still in spite of everything and NEP mm. and everything, still ends up emphasizing in exams and rote learning, as opposed to to emphasizing on concepts and mm. skills, um, and a growth of, uh, I think the adventurous part of the mind, the creative part of the mind. Absolutely. I think if you if you harp on those, eventually they will figure out for themselves mm. the mm. rest of the world, and that I think fundamentally important. I think in our education system, we mm. want to impose what we feel is the right set right of thing. information <laughs> on a student. I think it's up to them to figure that out. Right? You have to just give them the wings to travel far enough to explore for themselves. That is what we do not do. Right. Mm. Uh, exactly we will not solve this through a discussion in this this mm. two hours that we have but that i think is <laughs> yeah. something fundamental we should think about and should worry us absolutely unfortunately i think that persists in even at the higher mm. level even at the way that we educate our students at our mm. institutions mm. um and i struggle with this uh, often that i i and we have conversations about this but we don't really solve it eventually mm. is that yeah we are more comfortable as teachers we are more comfortable of walking in day after day every day to the class armed with this knowledge that we have gained over the last couple of decades and doing the same shit mm. year after year right? in class <laughs> yeah. right with the blackboard talk the same way we have figured it out right i think it, it the world is moving beyond that if you don't realize it 
we are going to be in trouble 20 years down the line down the line exactly. much of what we are exactly. doing in class is now available mm-hmm. in the world wide web the lectures whether you like it or not probably a better lecture than you just gave in your classroom mm. <laughs> by somebody else somewhere in the world yeah it yeah. is possible your lecture also if you have recorded is possibly one of the best lectures in your field that somebody else can benefit from if that person is studying in mit or harvard is possible <laughs> yeah like, your yeah. lecture is also on the web right the mm. point i'm trying to make is much of the resource that exists in the world wide web we don't need to mm. Mm. we get in the classrooms that gives us some freedom to be somewhat more forward thinking in being more hands on right being more adventurous in our classrooms right how about if you try to do that your dean of academics will come and catch you or somebody equivalent will come and catch you and say hey what the hell are you doing <laughs> you're supposed to be doing <laughs> this in class you're supposed to be completing the syllabus exactly as it is in class right um there is always resistance to change uh-huh. always right even within yourself if you have if you have a habit there will be resistance to change it right yeah from, absolutely. from absolutely. from yourself but i think we have to we have to think along those lines in in terms of thinking what can we do that is different from what you have been doing over the last 10 years that is the only way we progress even in teaching because we often think about along those lines in research but we don't think along those lines in teaching by the way teaching exactly i think i just end there because we I, we can go on for the whole day on this but okay. <laughs> you, you, you get the point of what i mean right we absolutely you absolutely think of how can we change what you've been doing in teaching how can we change what you've been doing over the last absolutely. absolutely because we have not changed in the last 30 years in teaching 30 years exactly you know, the pandemic yeah. came and went we went back to the classroom we as went back we didn't, we didn't learn anything from the pandemic very correct very correct you know it is ridiculous something... right? it is absolutely ridiculous and this is i'm talking of faculty you know i mean us uh, i blame us yes. right? yeah yeah and our administrators absolutely in fact there was a golden opportunity at the at the cusp of making a transition and i totally agree with bindu in fact one of the things which you emphasized was uh, for example uh, if you look at the experience what we gained out of the pandemic period the teaching actually under, underwent a very interesting change see i am not telling about uh, primary education i'm talking about uh, uh, secondary education and more so at a higher education higher level education, yeah uh, one could actually swivel towards let's say making things more you know online interactive and in- interactive using and, many uh, more resources than you have access to in a traditional blackboard classroom right absolutely right have the blackboard absolutely. there but have all that electronic stuff have have the world wide web at your fingertips i could get a movie exactly. out embed it i could absolutely. get a figure out draw on that explain things on that i suddenly have absolutely. lost it because we have all gone back to the traditional classroom exactly right? exactly um, exactly there is something which we are very uh, very badly missing in fact i am very glad that you you brought this up because as you very correctly mentioned that the information is not on premium right because that is available because you would actually have a resource which would present things probably even better than what a person is doing in a classroom but you can facilitate you can highlight you can discuss Uh, there is a lot of us a lot of things to to alter here yeah, I and i agree with you the right word there facilitate i think yeah. i see myself as a facilitator Facilitate. for, a, yeah. for a, a somebody younger discovering the world of science right mm. Mm. um i don't think i should be walking in front of him and leading him i think i should be mm. by his side by his or her side Uh, absolutely while, you know, and and saying this is what you have you know sometimes even go here there take some you know alternative routes uh, uh, and tell them this is where you explore to found the riches that you want you know i mean often we just give them what we think is right and that i think is the fundamental problem here fundamental right? problem absolutely happens, you of course cannot forego the basic education like mm. in, you know there is some things you need to learn the hard way Right? Absolutely. There's a certain pedagogical Absolutely. development of a topic. You need to learn the mm. hard way. That has to be done the right way, and possibly there is not much scope for reinventing yourself there. Seven. But there is the advanced courses, the other topics that there is this scope which benefits from this reinvention, which you are not Absolutely. doing. Absolutely, not doing. Okay. Exactly. That's the point. and in spite of the fact that you actually already have the resources see i'm not oh, yeah. talking about let's say 
a college we which is in the remote place. We are privileged, we are privileged. To have the resources, right? The, the people Absolutely. who like school children, poor children, they they do mm-hmm. not have the privilege to own a own mm-hmm. a smartphone or a mm-hmm. uh, what do you call those tabs? Tablet like tabs. Exactly. The people who are privileged who are not putting it to good use. Uh, and, good use. Uh, that is a shame, I think. Right. That's a shame. That's a shame. I I I totally concur with with your viewpoint on this. And an important point what you mentioned now. Okay, so now we got to branch a little bit out uh, going forward, and now we're going to uh, discuss a little bit on your own research, uh, 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 Dandy. In fact, yeah. uh, for listeners, you know, Dandy has some fantastic, uh, you know, portfolio of research, if I can use that particular word, because I wanted to make it more general. Uh, where it, the fact that you actually get trained in traditional aspects of astrophysics can now become so important is is very prevalent in in uh, Dandy's research. So, Dandy, tell us a little bit about your current research uh, uh, interests and the projects what you are involved in. Uh, give us a flavor of that. Yeah. Okay. So, um, okay. I, I, you know, if, shorn of everything at the most basic fundamental level, I am a. a, a what I would call uh, a theoretical magnetohydrodynamics person, uh, mm-hmm. applying the tools of magnetohydrodynamics to understand um, processes that occur in stars um, uh, in the cosmos. So what is, you know, I dropped this big word, uh, mm-hmm. magnetohydrodynamics. Mm-hmm. So what is it? So, okay. So, so perhaps people have heard of the term fluid dynamics or hydrodynamics, which is essentially you know, phenomena that occur uh, uh, in fluids, uh, mm. sort of uh, a class of material where they behave collectively uh, in a way that you can assign global properties like pressure, temperature, uh, density, uh, as well as flow profiles uh, as a function of temperature, as a function of time and space uh, to this to this state of matter, right? So gas, for example, can also behave like a fluid. Um, oceans uh, behave like fluids. Uh, your atmosphere, uh, the weather phenomena that happens uh, behaves like a fluid. Uh, the flow of your blood uh, essentially behaves like, like a fluid under very different conditions, but it's, it's, it behaves like a fluid. Uh, the interior of stars uh, behave like a fluid. Um, flow of matter from a, from a black hole, black hole jets behave like a fluid. Um, I can give you many, many examples of this. And of course, the curry that you cook, uh, the tea that you make in your, in your <laughs> pot also behaves like a fluid. With no convection going on, right? So when you replace the fluid, which is neutral, which is at, exists as atoms uh, mm. by, by a, a, a state of matter known as plasma, where you've heated up the fluid uh, to a high enough temperature that, uh, that the atoms are ionized. So you, now you have ions and electrons uh, then you're dealing with a system which uh, uh, is consisting of electrons and ions and there is motion in the system, large-scale motion. And so you're dealing mm-hmm. with the dynamics of uh, what I would call magnetized fluid and that's where the name magnetohydrodynamics comes in from because if you have a you know, motion of charged particles, it creates magnetic mm-hmm. fields mm-hmm. and often, mm-hmm. often if the coordinations are right in astrophysical systems, certainly you end up producing large-scale magnetic fields. So now you have the dynamics of plasma flows and magnetic fields all acting together to create this, this sort of fantastic phenomena that you observe in, in stars, uh, that you observe um, also in things like, uh, you know, tokamaks uh, mm, mm. and plasma in, yeah. in the yeah. laboratory plasmas, uh, which is one of, you know, it's a very, 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 very relevant <laughs> process for, for, for harnessing uh, plasma fusion energy. Right. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, so uh, this happens across uh, various domains of laboratory and space, more so in space because, um, at least in the observable universe, because ninety nine percent of the universe that you see is the the, the visible universe is made of plasma. Mm. plasma. Um, so uh, essentially, this is a, a subject that deals with the dynamics of magnetized plasmas. Mm. Okay, now you can apply it to different systems, and I ended up applying it to a star, which was our nearest star, the sun. I said that it was very boring once upon a time. So because mm-hmm. it was star, we figured it out, except that we had not, right? Yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> so anyway, <laughs> um, and then we slowly started realizing that uh, that 
space and we started realizing this with with time as we put more and more technologies in space like uh, satellites mm. Mm. that space mm. is not really you know completely empty with no environment mm. Mm. that was a traditional idea there's no environment exactly. space is completely empty it is it is it is better than the best vacuum you can get in, in on earth so it is empty mm. right? so mm. in the school books it's just fine you say it's empty right but there there is a changing environment in space there are photons mm. in space okay um there are charged particles coming in from the sun particularly so when 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 there are this large scale energetic events known as solar storms solar flares and solar coronal mass ejections which are energetic events where uh the sun is hosts very strong magnetic fields where this magnetic mm. fields violently destroy themselves and convert magnetic energy to to heat energy which heats up the plasma um which then radiates this very high energy photons in x-ray photons and extreme ultraviolet photons uh that heat also um accelerate charged particles from the sun mm-hmm. um mm-hmm. to a certain fraction of the speed of light um and when it's a very energetic eruption there is a it imparts enough kinetic energy to a large amount of plasma which literally escapes the gravity this very strong gravity of the sun um mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and flows you know is ejected not even flows ejected out of the sun known as a coronal mass ejection all of this are perturbations in this empty space okay same and, space. Uh, exactly. and these are like a, a sudden burst of high energy radiation and charged particles which can impact your satellites up in space mm-hmm. um they can also impact the earth's, uh, uh, ionosphere and inject a uh, large number of charged particles into it perturbing the state of the ionosphere which mm. uh, which disturbs your communications because ionosphere is critical to radio communications right um so your satellites are impacted your communication systems are, dis- are disrupted um also in high latitude countries uh, it induces large geomagnetic currents by mm. inducing mm. geomagnetic storms and so through mm. maximum mm. equations you can figure out that it induces geomagnetic currents which can trip power grids uh mm-hmm. and um is hazardous to oil pipelines for example mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, so also a lot of ground based technologies is impacted by the sun's activity since and this okay. realization came about i want to emphasize that this realization about the space changing space weather being so important for us uh, mm-hmm. uh, that now space faring nations are you know investing a significant fraction of of money funding to mm. investigate space weather uh, this realization came over the last three decades or so two three decades mm. when i was a student um i have heard of this term but barely mm. um i had to look at my thesis to figure out if i even use the term space weather in my thesis or not anyway okay okay i wrote mm. it in 2002 i had to look at it i don't remember off hand that i have certainly used it i don't mm. Uh, mm. which itself tells you mm. about the evolution mm. of a certain field right i field. my thesis was motivated from a completely fundamental aspect of mm. exploring how the sun produces its magnetic fields mm. that's mm. all okay i did not have a chapter on space weather that's where it ended mm. that's where it began and that's where it ended i i figured out some really fundamental nice stuff mm. uh, about about the sun's dynamo mechanism uh, which ended up in in science by the way Right? Yeah, okay. uh, um uh, one of the one of the papers without really having any strong um applied implications mm, mm, i want to mm. emphasize that and take a break okay <laughs> right okay that's how it began it began as a fundamental inquiry right mm, and the point mm. i'm trying to make is often people will tell you don't do this stuff because it's not hot don't do that stuff because you not mm. end up in nature or science it doesn't matter if you don't end up matter. in nature science to begin with okay to begin with i think what what matters is you're having fun doing what you are doing the rest will fall in place in place absolutely right absolutely. the rest will fall in place so that that is important okay mm. so um all right so i, I transition from there then after i got my phd in theoretical magneto hydrodynamics mostly doing mm. computational modeling of how the sun produces magnetic fields i decided i have had enough of theory i want to learn observations mm-hmm. um mm-hmm. and uh, <clears throat> this doesn't usually happen a lot of happy accidents uh, but i think if you are brave happy accidents happen 
Um, mm-hmm. So there was a conference in Kodaikanal Solar Observatory. It was an international conference, international union meeting. And there I met uh, somebody from the US, uh, mm. uh, Dick Canfield, who happened to be my first post, eventually became my first postdoc supervisor. So mm-hmm. so over this course of five, six days, I mean, I had, I had fun in Kodaikanal, but I also had a lot of conversations with people who were visiting. I was a PhD student then from mm-hmm. abroad. Mm-hmm. Dick Canfield and mm-hmm. I had some long conversations about about the work that I was doing, about the work that he was doing. He was an observer. He's, he was he's one of the world's foremost experts in magnetic field measurements. On the wow, side. okay. He had okay. literally built by hand this, this, this spectroporometers in Hawaii. Uh, mm. At some point in mm. time, he was in Institute of Astrophysics in Hawaii. When I met him, he was in Montana State University in Bozeman, mm. uh, near Yellowstone National Park. Um, so anyway, so then... Um, uh, I was, so in my final year of my PhD, I was, by the way, I got my first paper in my fourth year of my PhD. I also mm-hmm. emphasize, want to emphasize that because uh, often many of my students don't get their papers within the first three years or two years. And I mm-hmm. have to write thinly in that CSR form that, you know, no paper yet. And it makes me feel mm-hmm. bad. It's, even, it's actually very bad to demand a paper in the first two years anyway. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. I think it's perfectly fine if you want to a good problem, work hard, be patient, give yourself time, don't get frustrated. You will have that nice paper eventually. Okay. Um, well, anyway, coming back to this. Uh, so, so in my last year, when I was sort of thinking that, okay, I need to do something different, I'm sort of starting to get bored of theory. This hmm. guy out of the blue wrote to me saying that, hey, I have a position in Montana State University uh, working on solar magnetic field measurements uh, or, mm. you know, with apl- applications to understanding solar flaring events. Flaring is is outburst. Of- nice outburst, yeah. Um, so I said, okay, so this is like an opportunity because this is different mm. from what I've been doing and I have learned my shit. I know to do dynamos mm. now. I want to do, learn something else. Um, so I went, uh, I told him that fine, I will I will come as a post. I didn't apply anywhere else. Okay. Mm. Uh, okay. <laughs> For, for formalities, he, I think, asked for some recommendations from various people and all mm. that stuff. Mm. So that happened. And then by by the end of it, I actually had finished all the PhD money, the money I had. So I, I remember I wrote to him saying that if you don't give me the ticket to come to Montana, I'll not be able to come join you. So he sent me a ticket <laughs> to come. There. Wow. Okay. Was, that's a, that's a think, really good Now I think that's routinely done. I think now, I don't know whether it's routinely done. Maybe, well, moving costs are given, but I don't know whether they buy a ticket and send it to you. But yeah, I said I no, could yeah. come. But literally, I had 2,000 rupees left. In my SBI account, in ISC SBI account. <laughs> um, uh, so because I was having fun, mostly. Right? Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, so I went to Mountain. I learned something completely different. It again took me two years to publish my first paper as a postdoc. But I, again, I think human beings are very important. Mm-hmm. Uh, he, he sort of allowed me that time uh, to learn this new game, uh, which I think was nice. important. Um, and I spent four or five years there, uh, four, I mean, three years as a postdoc and then two years as a research scientist, learning all these different skills and produce, started producing. I mm. remember, and this is, you know, typically once upon a time as an observer in astrophysics, you would go to an observatory and sit down to do observations. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You don't do that nowadays. Nowadays, what you do is the data is taken by the by the sci- staff and the scientists yeah. who are there, Scienti- who are permanently employed in the, in the observatory. Mm-hmm. It's reduced for you. It comes mm. in a like, my for me the magnetic field measurements would come with a, a unit of gauss right in the data file <laughs> with solar latitude longitude and time and yeah, everything yeah, mentioned yeah, right yeah, yeah. anybody can analyze the data literally anybody mm. can analyze you don't need to be an expert observer right during my postdoc i had the steps i had literally the tapes from hawaii <laughs> Which were not reduced. So first, what I had to do I had to convert, I had to convert these magnetic tapes to to data in the computer, and then I had to reduce them using certain different schemes uh, that we that we had, like Uno Skumanak schemes and all that, to invert the data, get the magnetic field measurements, subtract the dark currents, the noise, finally get the reduced data. My first one and a half years was spent mostly sitting in the computer lab in the solar physics group of Montana doing that, <laughs> okay, and Wonderful. fishing in the weekends. I would go out fishing in the weekends to calm my mind. Yeah. Uh, where you no know, two days are spent on the river without catching anything. Anyway, <laughs> so, but by the end of it, I knew theory, I knew computation, I knew observations. Nice. That was, nice. I think, a very good decision I took. <clears throat> it challenged mm-hmm. me. I had mm-hmm. less papers, but it was fantastic. And then I could start thinking of my own problems. I could. I become mm-hmm. a complete solar physicist. 
not a physicist working in one domain of solar physics. Um, so that now I have PhD students who worked in theory, who worked in computation, who worked in observations, everything, data analysis. So, so that's something that's very important, I think. It also, as a theorist, if you understand data, that's very useful. As a as a as an observer or data analyst, if you understand theory, that is immensely useful. Um, absolutely, absolutely. I, I try to now sort of encourage my students to to understand this complementary sides of this mm. coin of science, theory and data, both. Mm. So anyway, so so then slowly in the US. Uh, I started writing my own proposals, winning them, and eventually I became an assistant research professor at Montana. Mm-hmm. Uh, I won some NASA grants. Uh, in the US, I, if you have to survive, you have to also write grants which have Im- strong immediate societal relevance. So, yeah, yeah. Space exactly, weather was yeah. coming up. Mm-hmm. That is where I learned space weather, that point in time, mm-hmm. in the later phase of my my stint in the US. So I spent six and a half years in the US, long time before I applied back for positions in, the, in India. But I think it's completely mm-hmm. worth it uh, mm-hmm. uh, to, to spend that time time there because I, I I was exposed to completely different sets of ideas, ideas, new yeah. challenges. And I picked, I, I was like, uh, like a, I don't know what, like a, I had my mind and my eyes wide open and picking everything up. And that really helped me grow as a scientist after I came back. I have now, you know, not only do I do what I started doing when I was a PhD mm. student, dynamos, understanding how stars, not just the sun, produce their magnetic fields. Um, I have, in India, developed, you know, computational models for space weather forecasting that no other group in India has done, mm. Um, mm. which uh, some of which are better than the best models in the world. Uh, nice. Anybody in the world has. Um and now, finally, also I have been involved in, in stretching my imagination to figuring out life in the universe. Why do we live mm-hmm. in the astrophysical ecosystem? What is it? What conditions of planets and stars allow lives to form? And when I say conditions, I'm not talking of the biosphere. I'm talking of the astrosphere. Astrosphere. Okay. I'm, I'm talking okay. of the astrophysical ecosystem. Mm-hmm. Uh, how does... The suns. I let me make it now. Make it more specific in a way that you or others can appreciate. How has the sun's radiative energy output, radiation output, mm-hmm. changed over the last billions of years? How has it magnetic and energetic output, like the storms, mm. space weather, changed over the last few billions of years over the sun's lifetime, essentially? Particularly over the last billion of you know billion year, the last three hundred four hundred million years, mm-hmm. when life took shape. On planet Earth, right? Nice, nice. And what does it imply for our search of habitable exoplanets mm. in mm. worlds beyond our own? Right. So I strongly believe that uh, that we can't think of our various domains in isolation. I mm. can't only just think of a distant star and a distant planet or the distant cosmos. All there, but all have existed in isolation. They've all existed by talking to each other, by communicating to each other through the language of mm. physics or chemistry or biology or whatever, right? Um, through, through photons, by the way. You would, you mm. would understand mm. that. Certainly through photons. If the particles yeah. travel, but they, they, don't, they have a scattering cross-section. Photons yeah. can get absorbed, yeah. But if there's nothing like, you know, when if you are, most of the universe is very, you know, it's largely transparent uh, unless you hit a star or a planet, right? Photons travel very far. Very fast. Uh, yeah. So, uh, so photons are also communicators, right? The the heat of the sun, the temperature mm. of the sun, uh, the high energy radiation during storms is communicated through photons, right? Mm. Either low mm. energy or high energy to the Earth's atmosphere. Absolutely. What if you lived in an extreme environment when the sun's ultra extreme ultraviolet X radiation is extremely strong? What did it do to the Earth's atmosphere, right? Mm. Uh, would it have helped in the synthesis of early you know, primordial uh, molecules. Nice. Or organs, nice. Right? So this is a question that people are now asking, that astrobiologists, astrophysicists, mm. Uh, mm. physicists, atmospheric modelers are coming together and asking, right? I call this the astrophysical ecosystem. Right? Uh, so that's mm. another item mm. which is not applied at all, right? In the sense mm. that it's completely esoteric. Uh, it's something that is just, I mean, it's a human, it's my curiosity. I want to know how is it that, that we live and that some planets uh, 
there is a possibility of life and other planets there cannot be what conditions govern that and for me of course i began as a stellar physicist physicist studying mm. a star mm. so what does a star do to govern this environment is something that's a fundamental question that that uh, that uh, appeals appeals to me so so i remember that this time we had this um, we decided that in the physics department before the physics open day that we had we would just have a meeting of the faculty where we would talk about what is what is driving us um, mm. Mm. In the last one year or so, right? I mean, mm. uh, what research topic is driving us? So, I had this. I had this. The first slide I had just one word, which was mm. it seemed appropriate because I was just really turning forty nine also. That one word was mm. just life. Life. You know, what's what's <laughs> life, right? So, <laughs> so that's the new thing that uh, that I've I've been into. Um, for Wonderful. a year now, Wonderful. using some of the same techniques that I've been utilizing. Mm. Because it turns mm. out that mm. the winds, the plasma winds, which is essentially mm. fluid dynamics or magnetic dynamics, mm. outflow the winds, how fast, how strong it is, and whether the planet has a magnetosphere or not, determines how much of the atmosphere you can hold on to. Uh, if the winds of the star is very strong and your magnetosphere is very weak, then you can lose mm. the atmosphere due to erosion of the plasma winds from the star, right? This happens yes. over billions of years, so you can actually completely lose your atmosphere. It happens to Mars. It has happened yes. to Mars. Mars exactly. has lost uh, atmosphere after losing its magnetic fields, its magnetosphere, mm. because of erosion by the solar wind. So now we know that Mars is inhabitable. At least on the surface, it's not possible to have life, right? Whereas mm. Earth holds mm. life. And it's a clear example that it matters, right? There are all these conditions, right? Whether you have a magnetosphere, how strong is the wind from the star? All of this come in and and impact whether it's life is possible on a planet or not, uh, mm. and it's uh, it's strange if if I you know if you you know if you if you actually imagine that planet Earth is the only planet we have evidence of that mm. host, mm, mm, mm. right? So the sun is a very special star. Special star, exactly. It's a exactly. very special star. So if I advise mm. the editors of Astro and Astrophysics, I think the sun should <laughs> come up right in front. <laughs> <laughs> wonderful wonderful yeah <laughs> yeah yeah no no it's so so true because uh, the fact that you are now able to harbor life is some is probably one of the most important uh, kind of viewpoints which has not been emphasized because if you look at uh, i mean I, of course i'm talking slightly more from a general viewpoint e- even within the realm of the observable universe we don't have any evidence of life in any anywhere other else, form, anywhere else, anywhere else, yeah. and it's a very intriguing question, right? Because this is absolutely, absolutely, yeah, absolutely yeah. right. And there are billions and billions of stars, and there are more planets, right? More planets, exactly, right? exactly. And yet, in spite of all our advances in figuring out the universe, observing the universe, we have as yet not found yet evidence of life. That's, not found in it. That's not trivial. I mean, it should make you think. It's not, think absolutely, about Earth absolutely, and about our star. Right? Absolutely, right. absolutely, fascinating, fascinating. You know, you know, I would actually take a, a specific kind of a, a, a deviation and ask you a slightly kind of an off, off-topic question. Sure. Danny, why, did, why did you come back to India after all this, this well, kind of experience? Yeah, that question thing? has been asked, mm-hmm. asked before. So we were very yeah. comfortable. In fact, uh, in fact, I never left Montana because you mm-hmm. see, um, it was a beautiful place. Uh, we lived in a place called Bozeman. Uh, mm, mm. One, one, one side of it was the Gallatin Range. Uh, the other mm. side was the Madison Range of mountains. And this this valley, little valley, was overlooked by the Bridger Mountains. I would wake up and open the doors. The snow-capped mountains, green valleys, blue skies, fantastic. And Yellowstone was one and a half hours drive away. Mm. Oh, Many okay. rivers okay. and lakes where you could fish. Um, and a chilled out life. Um, yeah, but except this, that I did my PhD in India. Uh, my wife mm. uh, also did her PhD uh, in India. Um, and then we left for the US. Our child was born in the US. Um, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and somehow, having also having seen my parents, my father, my mother struggle in an Indian setup, in a, in a very middle class mm-hmm. family, having survived mm-hmm. through this, uh, having also gone through the whole education system in India, it's funny because I, I I don't really think of myself as having deep roots or being like very emotional, but somehow there was an mm. attachment that I should always come back and give back something mm. Uh, mm. into the system, which which brewed me. Right, I came mm. out of this mess really, uh, 
I do not know if I have I would have had that sentiment if I left too early. Uh, mm, mm. But I actually did. You know, my most of my education was sponsored by Indian citizens, by the way. Yeah, yeah, uh, same here. Also, awesome. like except the schooling system for a bit, where it was you know it was private schools, colleges, ISC was basically supported, right? I mean, mm, yeah, 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 exactly. Uh, yeah. And I wanted to give back something. And then when our daughter was about four years old, and we were getting very happy, that point in time, I think sometime we just we had a conversation and decided that if we don't start applying now uh mm. it will be it will we are going to do a disservice to our daughter in the sense that mm. we are going to drag her out of a system she's got used to and take her back to a system that is going to be a very you know big challenge for her mm. so when she was i think about 3 3 and 1/2 we started applying for positions then got a couple of positions here there and we sort of you know we managed to get positions here so we just moved here uh, both of us so that's all the two body problem at the point in time as well so Yeah, we ended up here when our daughter was just about four and a half, four or four years old at the time mm-hmm. when she was about to go to school. School, yeah, school. Yeah. So I, so <clears throat> in some ways there was always a calling that I should, mm. uh, I should move back. We should move back to India. Now, having come back to India and worked for two decades, I don't have that feeling anymore. Now I mm. feel I can work from anywhere. because now i feel mm. i have given back to my country but it is mm. essential for me right which doesn't mean i'm going to not fly back somewhere i'm not saying that mm. i'm saying that i feel content that to... i have done that and now nice. i feel a little free and a little frisky that okay now i can be back on my adventures sort of <laughs> nice nice <laughs> a very 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 interesting uh, trajectory also uh, one should mention So, uh, uh, Dandy, can you also tell about your recent experience having been involved in Aditya Mission, where uh, there was some very interesting kind of, uh, you know, uh, both science and technology, which is supposed to have kind of converged to a very interesting Lagrangian point, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> metaphorically yeah, yeah. speaking. Okay. So, 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 could you so tell Aditya us a little mission, bit about it? Yeah, yeah. The Aditya yeah. Mission is uh, India's first space-based. Uh, um, for into mm. solar observations observing the sun we have had the kodaikanal yes. solar observatory uh, yes. a hist- one of the historic one of the oldest solar observatories in the world mm. uh, we have had the udaipur solar observatory in udaipur mm. Mm. Uh, but we have not had a mission space mission to observe the sun so um, yeah. uh, believe it or not there are about i think 3 dozen 3 dozen missions dozen missions observing the sun and space weather Uh, by various agencies primarily because of the importance of solar activity on our space environment so india's first mm. mission is a bit mm. late but nevertheless it's a it's a it's a world class observatory in the sense that it's just at one instrument it has multiple different instruments mm. uh, in, you know all put together in one spacecraft to study different aspects of solar activity um it is on a long journey right now to lagrange point mm. l1 and i should therefore tell mm. you a little bit about why lagrange point l1 Mm, mm, so lagrange mm. point l1 is this imaginary location in space which is changing by the way all the time mm, uh, mm. but its relative position with respect to the earth and the sun remains fixed mm. in that imaginary space so if you draw a line from the sun to the earth right imagine a point which is close to the earth about 1 1 by 100 mm. times the distance from the sun to the earth so basically point 01 times the distance of the sun to the earth close to the earth. so therefore mm. it's very close to the earth right um that point now the imagine that line at the earth is revolving around the sun that line is mm. also revolving that imaginary line along with the along with the earth because it's a sun earth line right that point sits on that line close mm. to the earth moving along with earth as it moves along the sun because the gravitational force of the sun mm. the earth and the centripetal force of a satellite that you place there some velocity mm. finally balance out that's called lagrange nice. point l1 so you place a satellite there um, that satellite will will move while the earth is moving around the sun the satellite will also move sitting mm. on the sun earth line along with the earth around the sun so it's continuously seeing the sun it's also continuously close to the earth it's not falling nice. behind in the orbit or anything like that it's moving with the earth 
So you can observe the sun continuously. You can also send back telemetry continuously to Earth. So it's a very nice location for observing the sun, uh, preferred location for observing the sun. Mm -hmm. um, if you want to do observations of the cosmos, where the sun, you want to collect photons, which is far and few in between, like, you know, the photon flux is very, very small. The sun is a big problem for you. It's mm. a noise. Mm. So mm. you want to sit in Lagrange point L2, which, mm. guess where? Just behind, is behind Earth line, <laughs> behind Earth. So the Earth shadows the sun out. Yes. So you don't yes. see the sun. And you, you, you <laughs> face the other way, you are looking at the universe without any sunlight falling on you, right? Mm, That's mm. where JWST is, James West mm, mm, Lagrange point L2, mm. uh, because it doesn't want the noise, you know, <laughs> uh, <laughs> the sun, basically. Yeah. <laughs> Whereas we are in L1, it's continuously <clears throat> facing, the, facing the sun. Mm. Okay, so Aditya has seven instruments, uh, which are going to look at uh, the solar ultraviolet radiation, which is very important for driving atmospheric dynamics and climate dynamics. Mm. Solar X origin of solar X ray radiation uh, and solar flares. Uh, X rays uh, ionize the Earth's upper atmosphere. X rays are also mm. uh, emitted when a solar flares, uh, uh, flare occurs, a uh, solar course, storm yeah. occurs. So it's a probe of the, of the origin of solar storms as well. Uh, it's, uh, it's going to image uh, the chromosphere and the upper layers of the sun. Uh, it's just the solar atmosphere uh, mm. in the ultraviolet wavelength, in actually about 11 different wavelengths in the ultraviolet range, near ultraviolet range, to figure out how energy flows from the near surface layers to the upper layers to the corona. Upper. Uh, mm. And also mm. it has a has a corona graph, which is going to look at uh, how solar storms propagate out, how coronal mass ejections propagate out from near sun and, uh, and explore the origins of coronal heating, which heats the sun's mm. corona to a million degrees. Then these are all remote sensing instruments, which are basically mm -hmm. collecting photons. Uh, then there are a few in-situ instruments. Uh, the in-situ instruments are going to look at the flux and the energy and the speed of, of um, particles in the solar wind or in solar storms while they're passing the spacecraft at Lagrange mm -hmm. Pondel. Nice. Um, it nice. also has a magnetometer, which is going to measure the magnetic field content mm -hmm. in the plasma wind while it's passing the spacecraft. And the interesting thing here again is that um, this space environment which is passing the spacecraft that you're measuring in mm. about 30 minutes to 40 minutes it will travel and hit earth because ah, nice. the, the wind flows ra roughly radially out of the sun mm. approximately mm. radial out of the sun so it will like connect along the sun earth line and it will first encounter the spacecraft and then encounter earth um, okay. so uh, if you could continuously get the data out, if you're quick with analyzing, you will get a very little bit of window, but you will get a small window for understanding what space weather is going to hit you. Wonderful. Wonderful. And, and so we are a co-investigator in the Solar Ultraviolet Imaging Telescope, which is being mm. built by an institution, uh, was built by an institution yeah. in Pune, by the way. Pune, uh, yeah. Ayuka. Ayuka. Uh, in collaboration with us, ISRO and some other institutions. Uh, so we had some bad students and engineers and myself contributing to this. Solar Ultraviolet Imaging Telescope. I also chaired the uh, a committee that ISRO constituted in 2019 uh, called the Aditya L1 Space Weather Monitoring and Predictions Committee, uh, mm -hmm. which was charged with, with uh, coming out with recommendations and strategies to utilize the data from the mission uh, for space weather monitoring and space weather forecasting. Mm. Uh, because mm. Aditya was not originally envisaged as a space weather mission. It was envisaged as a fundamental solar physics mission. Mm. 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 Uh, but we're still trying to see what data, not just data, what alerts we can extract out of Aditya for space weather. And so we nice. made a specific set of recommendations. Hopefully, some of that is going to be implemented by ISRO. Implement. Uh, well, we are working to ensure that that some of that <laughs> is. <laughs> right. So, yeah. So uh, you were there at the launch, right? If I, if I I'm correct. Launch, you know, what an experience it was. I mean... Uh -huh. uh, First of all, none of us knew um, <laughs> that we are going to get there. Uh, because until, f I think, three days, it was a bit slow with this because mm -hmm. they were just recovering from Chandrayaan mission. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and to get a launch pass in that VIP gallery, you have to go through a lot of, I mean, I think this is a lot yeah. of internal process, which I don't understand. Yeah. Anyway, mm -hmm. bottom line is none of, not, not even the principal investigators of the instruments, none of us, uh, 
some of the students nobody had any inkling even like three days before that we were eventually going to end up there but you all had hoped that wow. we were going to end up there right so our clearance came in like i think saturday was the launch second Mm. uh second uh, august right august august yeah yeah second august saturday. i think it was a saturday it was certainly a saturday mm. we finally came to on wednesday night i think wednesday night <laughs> when our, our clearance came in uh so I, i had i had asked explicitly for a few students uh clearance mm. for mm. students also so i think we are one of the few groups which ended up there with students wow um, <laughs> uh which was which was nice i think uh, yeah yeah always very uh, really nice yeah. and then we were this in this this in this gallery which you see in durdashan and other other yeah, this yeah. nice gallery with ac air conditioning and nice yeah. lovely seats and all that stuff except that that people had told me that okay all good but 30 seconds you should before the launch you should get out of there and go to the go to the you know this outside balcony outside right, balcony. right? it's like, you know more hot sort of unpleasant but that's where you get to see the real launch real <laughs> yeah so we did that so many of us sort of uh, and we saw that you know i mean people were already exiting before one minute like countdown was going on right at one minute mm. so people who know were exiting so we also exited this nice place and went to the balcony and crowded out there balcony mm. so four so the this this mission control is 5 kilometers away away uh, from, from the launch launch from the launch pad we are all in sri kota mm. this island uh, yeah, i think yeah. any, any i think the nearest stuff that people can be is like 3 or 4 kilometers away where there's some measurement yeah, for yeah. measuring certain things all the vips and the mission control is 5 kilometers away in this place mm-hmm. but this balcony you know overlooks a forest trees and then suddenly you hear some rumbling right and then out wow. of the forest you know, the sky <laughs> this nose cone of the rocket emerges yeah. you don't see the nose cone very clearly because you see uh, the trail more than anything trail right? more oh yes yeah yes. and then within like a like sometime the ground starts shaking below your feet right wow <laughs> and it's like that's an amazing feeling you know when you feeling. get out of the ac mission control to the varanda where you sit down and see the damn monster right lifting up <laughs> and the ground shaking uh, uh you know and this this whole air full of the i mean <laughs> that's that's it right so it's it's, it's the excitement of launch but aditya is not yet a success this is what i keep on telling people Yeah, Chandrayaan yeah, yeah. was a technology, most a technology demonstration mission. We have gone and landed in the moon. It's a huge success, right? Absolutely. Aditya will only succeed when he can get to do science with the data. Science wise, it's yeah. an important difference. It's not a technology. Mm. Yes, technology. We are reaching L one point for the first time. Mm. Again, mm. right? That has not yet happened. It will reach L one mm. on the first mm. week of January. If we are successfully managed to inject ourselves into L one, that will be a good technology demonstration. Technology. But the major success will really come if the if the instrument succeeds. So, we will wait. I mean, you asked me this question one year down the line. That has Aditya succeeded? Will be in a position. Yes, to yes. We will. We'll get you back on 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 the Pratidhwani. <laughs> in fact, uh, I will surely uh, we'll do a, a yeah. and another interesting strand which I am also starting as part of Pratidhwani is something called as emergence, where okay. we will actually talk about emerging areas and other things. Sure. That's that's also coming up. Wonderful, okay. uh, uh, Debendu. So uh in that sense I would also kind of now want to expand a little bit more from your own research to your thoughts on uh, uh research in India per se I would want to touch upon two important aspects uh and which is something which is important I assume because of the fact that there is now an evidence which is also coming out that the participation of uh, women in in physics especially uh is to be improved uh, visa we let's say other kind of uh, branches including biology and even to that extent uh, some uh, uh, elements of engineering uh in what way should we actually uh, improve our situation uh, uh, endu in how do we really go about uh, uh, kind of uh, solving this issue or rather at least addressing this particular issue okay so i think it has to be a multi i mean first of all i think it is a problem and it's a real yes. problem and physics yeah, department yeah. it's a terrible problem Mm. right i mean mm. uh, in in ge- physics departments around mm. the country i mean not just around the country i think physics departments around the world i think uh, yes certainly. yeah, yeah you are right. absolutely right it's across the world yeah yeah, yeah. i mean uh, but certainly in india it's a, the problem is that multi dimensional i think mm. uh, uh okay so i think first of all uh you really have to start with students right yeah absolutely in the sense that absolutely. you have to make hard sciences uh, i will just talk mm. about physics or maths because i'm more mm. useful mm. 
something which is more attractive uh, to women, right? You have to attract them, right? Uh, I think often, given the fact that it is mostly practiced by men, you mm, create an mm. aura that is a subject suitable for men. Exactly, yeah. yeah. Just an aura or a perception. Mm, that itself mm. is a put-off, right? Put-off. It will put Absolutely. off people who are actually capable of doing hard sciences to think Absolutely. that, oh, look, this is a men's game and therefore mm, I'm in mm. This is sending a wrong mm. message, right? Therefore, that, that aura uh, or that perception also has to change. This impact change. implies that there has to be some cultural changes Absolutely. in the way we men portray ourselves or, or, or behave or, or the aura that we create. I think that is important. We have to create an aura of being more, uh, not just inclusive. Uh, uh, I think that's not just enough. I think of being yeah, more yeah. welcoming. Uh, 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 and also that this is a suitable profession for for. Yeah. For women, I think that aura has to be also created, right? So just to start from there, um, absolutely, right. And then uh, after after you get that, then then if you look at it, the numbers, I think in num- terms of PhD students, mm. it's better than it was earlier. Yeah, yeah, it has but improved. The question you can ask yeah. is what is happening to them, right? Are mm. we managing to retain some of the students that we are ourselves producing, uh, mm. women scientists? Uh, mm. In the sciences, I think, and this has been this has been talked about by people who are much more capable uh, and who have actually worked in the field. Yes. The leaky pipeline. I think the leaky yes. pipeline is more leaky for women than it is for men, due to men, various factors, including marriage, childbearing age, uh, yes. more yes. responsibilities yes. in the house than men, and that is, I think, all true, right? Uh, <laughs> absolutely. Right. So, absolutely. Uh, so that, see, I don't think. You can completely plug that leak. I mean, you cannot solve mm. the pipe, the the leakages in the pipeline that exists because of other reasons, because other reasons, reasons absolutely, social economic reasons. Yeah. But as scientists, as academic organizations, you can be aware, aware. Of, the, yeah. of the challenges of that leaky pipeline for women, and therefore evolve your rules to enable women to join in spite of the leaky pipeline. For example, mm. there is often an unwritten code of con, you know, code that you have to join like below 35. We are not going mm. to hire mm. for over 35. Mm. There should certainly be no age limit uh, mm. for women uh, in, in terms of hiring, right? When you when you are looking at competitiveness of CVs, if mm. somebody, you know, somebody has, has born a child or something like that, you should certainly think of them of, of having at least two years fewer than a male counterpart. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. In, in, you know, in terms of having produced those papers in two years mm. fewer than any other, you know, any other male counterparts, right? Because that's what it takes. I think that's the investment that's physiologically, biologically, otherwise mm. is also there. So you have to be aware of it. Uh, and so if you say, okay, this is what a competency for me, for a male would be like. For a female, mm. I'm not talking of unmarried mm. Uh, single woman here. I'm talking mm. of somebody who has raised mm. a family. I think I mean, clearly that allowance uh, for somebody who has raised a child has to be there. I think that is important. Has to be there. Absolutely. Has to be there. Absolutely. Right? Um, this is just one example. Uh, you can also do many things that is supportive for women after you hired them. That mm. that mm. creates a positive mm. image of a place which tells you that it's women friendly, like having childcare, right? Absolutely. Uh, uh, a school on campus, for example. Right, uh, those those are important, of course. Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. Beyond that, and this is maybe somewhat controversial. Uh, should we have special drives for women? Mm. My point is, we do have special drives for uh, for uh, people from less less privileged circumstances, mm. right? Mm. Economic, otherwise. Yeah. This is yeah. precisely that, right? Here you have social, 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 social cultural circumstances. Culture. Is in principle making them less privileged compared to men, right? So in principle, absolutely, I think one can have special uh, rights, uh, even for women for hiring them, right? Uh, so targeted hiring is absolutely fine in my fine in my mm-hmm. book. Whether it's fine in the legal book or not, that's something else to worry about. But I think it's just absolutely fine. I think it should be fine in any, any, you know, anybody else's yeah, yeah, yeah. I, mean, yeah. I, I agree yeah. with you. In fact, uh, you, you are also a signatory to this uh, Hyderabad cha- Charter uh, yes, of, uh, for gen- Gender Equity, which is yes. actually a very nice document. It actually it really 
uh, gives a very nice kind of overview. Uh, of course, I'll be linking all these things in the show notes, including some of the things what we have already yeah, discussed. Yeah, I mean, uh, so I think, yeah, I've been privileged to be actually associated with some of the women in that, mm. you know, who drafted the Harvard, Hyderabad charter. Some of them were actually from the Ast- so Astronomical Society of India in that way has been pretty forward thinking in a, in a, in a mm. way that we, mm. the ASI had a, a working group on gender equity for a very long time which is fairly yes. active, fairly vocal, you know, uh, and in every meeting, annual meeting, uh, um, and in between, they have talks and, and they have, they throw out, you know, statistics of what's going on in astronomy in terms of, um, so I'm not saying that's fundamentally changing the scenario very quickly. No, but at least mm. people are getting mm. aware of what's going aware on. Aware of it. Yeah. And I think yeah. in astronomy, it's a little better than in than mm. other, other branches yeah. of flights now, I think. See, that, that, so, yeah, that is so an that, important That was a good, good charter, I think. And I hope that's all yeah. that would... People need to talk about it at least. That that yeah, has to happen. Absolutely, exactly. It, it, it has to be really given more publicity than mm. um, what it is now. Uh, uh, kind of uh, people are aware of. Great. This actually brings us also to slightly more, you know, lighter stuff <laughs> on the on the conversation, uh, where uh, I'm going to request you to uh, kind of uh, uh, speak a few uh, words or sentences in your mother tongue. To give a flavor of uh, of uh, what you are interested in, and also what motivates you to do research, uh, and uh, I, I assume your mother tongue is Bengali. <laughs> yep, right. Okay, so this is just for 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 the sake of others. So uh, Pawan has just now asked me to speak something in, in in my mother tongue, which is Bengali. So now I'll sort of make some uh, remarks about uh, perhaps myself, my science, and what motivates me in, uh, yeah, in Bengali. Right. Um, so, I'm Dibendu Dibendu Nondi. I'm a Isaac Kolkata professor, physicist. Um, I'm a Chotabala Jormuchi Jamshit Pura Chotabala Katichi Odisha, Tarpore class four, Kolkata Ashi, Kolkata, uh, Bibino School, Kashipu English School, Senyam, Senzi Vasi Parashanapura, Tarpore, uh, IS the Jai PhD Kote, uh, Tarpore Chabachur, America Bari Kata, Kata, Pore, or Kolkata Firashi, Isaac Kolkata Economic Professor. I research kori shurjo niye, shurjo activity niye, shurjo activity amader muhakashe abha to edi kore. Ei muhakashe je 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 changing abha shita amader satellite the affect kore, telecommunication, GPS navigation network, satellite operation, isho affect kore. To amar kaj holo ei shurjo activity ke bojha ebang ei ei মহাকাশের আবহাওয়াকে পূর্বাভাস করা সেটা নিয়ে আমি কম্পিউটার মডেলিং স্যাটেলাইট ডেটা অ্যানালাইসিস করি আমি ইন্ডিয়ার প্রথম মিশন আদিত্য এলমানের সঙ্গে যুক্ত আমি একজন কো ইনভেস্টিগেটর এই মিশনে আমার ভালোবাসার মধ্যে আমি বেড়াতে খুব ভালোবাসি ছবি তুলতে ভালোবাসি খেতে ভালোবাসি সিনেমা দেখতে ভালোবাসি অন্য বাঙালি অনেক বাঙালিদেরই একই ধরনের ভালোবাসা থাকে আর কি এবং অনেক হয়তো বেশিরভাগ লোকজনই আমি আমার তো মনে সবাই এসব জিনিস ভালোবাসা করতে আর আমি মাছ ধরতেও ভালোবাসি খুব এখন সেটা খুব কমে গেছে ফুটবলও খেলতে পারে সময় এখন আর খেলতে পারি না চোখের জন্য এই ভালো থাকবেন ভালোবাসবেন ভালো লাগলো একটু বাংলায় সুযোগ পেয়ে কথা বলতে পাওয়ার নিজে বোধ হয় কানাডিগা আছে এখন পুনেতে প্রোগ্রামটা করছে ইংরেজিতে খুব ভালো প্রোগ্রাম করে বিভিন্ন সায়েন্টিস্টদের নিয়ে এখন আমার বাংলায় বলতে বললো সেটা খুব মজার লাগলো আমার নিয়ে ভালো থাকবেন সবাই Right. Wow, wonderful. <laughs> I just told them that Pawan is himself from Karnataka. He is a Karnataka, yeah. but he's in Pune. He's making this program in English and he's allowing me to speak in Bengali. So that's amazing. Bengali. So you know, that's, stay that's well. India. That's, a, that's, a, that's, a, that's India for us. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, wonderful. Wonderful, yeah. uh, Dimendu. In fact, you know, uh, this is something also very important. I strongly feel that the language should not be a barrier to do science. And uh, right. this is kind of a very small initiative, as I, as I mentioned. And I'm very glad that everybody actually is giving their views, at least in some some form, and uh, in in some particular duration of uh, of their own mother tongue, which I think is another important aspect uh, of of doing science because uh, we sometimes lose out a lot of people uh, for the very fact that they don't have kind of conversant uh, language, uh, and uh, since English is not their first language or even second language, they miss out on doing science, but they can still do it, right? That is what uh, is, 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 the, uh, is the... Yeah, I mean, I think that is, it goes beyond that. I mean, uh, mm. not only that, I think people who are who come from uh, sort of a place, 
uh, which is not necessarily very co- I mean I and you we have grown up in cosmopolitan places mm. we can we can speak English almost as if it's our first language but the people who mm. are not that right I mean absolutely in India absolutely. is full of people who are not that we are, we often have students who are not that right absolutely uh, absolutely unfortunately so if you're not being able to reinvent yourself and not able to speak as if you know when I mean, that English is pretty much your first language you don't have that package around you mm. Uh, mm. these people get left behind i'm seeing that mm. i'm seeing that amongst mm. my own students uh, mm. who have graduated and gone off in terms of finding jobs and things like mm. this mm. Mm. Uh, unless you're of a certain kind that we mm. like to see it's very difficult for you to get hired mm. if you're a bit anomalous if you have that little bit of you know slightly different tinge to your character to the way you talk the way you walk mm. uh, if if you're not an anglicized version that we like to see that it's a bit of an issue right you know, yeah, yes yes yeah i think this has to change change somehow. absolutely i absolutely. think this has to change and often i think we sit on the other desk side of the desk and we ourselves make this mm. it's going to cause sometimes i realize that that i am also myself to sometimes blame because i also mm. sometimes mm. judge people based on that which probably you know mm. took a little while for me to realize that i think we should be more careful we should give allowance for somebody to be different different absolutely uh, right absolutely uh, this is something that um, that's very important we got to bought it out mm. it's not easy to solve uh, but this is something that we should should worry us, especially in a country like india where we are a diverse set of absolutely people, right. set of uh, people under one nation right so yeah absolutely yeah very 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 pertinent points what you mentioned right now uh, kind of a last segment where i would request you to actually recommend to our listeners and to me about what really motivates you from general reading art music anything which motivates you okay um like two things first which are which uh, are probably a bit unusual uh, uh that i recommend first and then the, then the stuff which i'm sure that other people also like so, okay number mm. one is when i was a student you know i see i led the is in hr club so in fact ah. during during my time we bought tents camping mm. gear basically tents sleeping bags sleeping pa- mats uh, we mm. bought uh, mm. the small gas stoves and cookers we would go out hiking uh, trekking in the mountains we'd get lost for 2 3 days <laughs> not the mm. kind of treks that you do nowadays where you are close to civilization live in places and you just walk no would go into wilderness where you not see anybody for 2 3 days um wow <laughs> so i was an avid trekker and i did mm. to some extent i mean that i cannot do any more in in <laughs> those kind of wild terms or just go out with like 20 kg rucksack on my back um, <laughs> with a cooking stove hanging with potatoes and and dal and rice for making khichdis <laughs> <laughs> uh, anymore into the wilderness, but uh, I, I love traveling. Mm. I love mm. discovering new places. I love traveling. That's something that uh, that drives me a lot. Uh, mm. So if I get mm. stuck in a place for too long, I just get upset. Mm. Um, mm. Very upset. <laughs> um, I I love Latin American music. This is also very unusual. Uh-huh. To bring it up. I I learned salsa. Uh, uh, wow! Is it? <laughs> fantastic while well, right in the yeah. us uh, mm. i love that like, little tango and salsa music also i like like very much um mm. uh those are unusual stuff that when you come back to mm. the usual mm. usual things mm. uh, uh amongst amongst the kind of music that i like i really like indian classical as well as western classical both sitar mm. is my favorite instrument mm. uh, amongst mm. the indian instrument sitar is my favorite instrument uh, um uh and amongst the western instruments violin is mm, uh, mm. my favorite uh, instrument um i like hindustani classical vocal also uh, uh i have my prejudices uh, uh, and singers <laughs> who I like not like but then you know my one of my earliest memories is uh, is uh, in in as a student is in isc i don't remember the name of the festival that is to happen in isc uh over uh, that is to be done by a certain organization but they took mm. the gym khana they used to take the gym khana over uh, once a year uh listening to um to uh, um uh, are what is his name uh singing bhairavi uh vimshan joshi vimshan uh, joshi joshi uh, five five thirty in the morning and the green wow. chakra light coming up the, i mean the, you know story of sunlight daylight coming up and vimshan mm. singing very i mean 
What a memory <laughs> I have of that. Uh, oh my God. In Calcutta, we have this Dover Land Music Conference, which is fantastic. I, I try to go mm. there. Uh, mm. it's like, uh, we get the best of Indian classical music there every year. I mean, it's just amazing. Um, yeah, Pune is a great place for music also. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, it's big, big here. Very big. Yeah, yeah. It's very so, big yeah. yeah, that also. Uh, and cinema. Uh, I love mm. a good movie. I, I love mm. a good movie. Uh, nice, nice. So, yeah. I think wow. those are usual stuff. I love eating, by the way. I love eating. And, you know, <laughs> funnily enough, what, what is the stress buster for me? Cooking. Uh-huh. Cooking. Um, okay, nice. nice. Stress buster. You know, so I have the privilege of being able to say that. Let me make it very clear. Yeah. It's yeah. not that I'm cooking every day, but I have the privilege <laughs> to be able to cook when I want to. Right? To want to. Yeah. Uh, that's clearly a privilege. And and I like to do it as a stress buster. So. Nice. Yeah. Nice. I can cook a wow. mean biryani for you. <laughs> ah, man. <laughs> that's even a, sambar, <laughs> even a sambar. Even a sambar. <laughs> You want to sound bad. Wonderful. That's the, that's the influence from the other half, so of course. <laughs> <laughs> wonderful, wonderful. Uh, Danny, this has been a, a you know very illuminating and engaging, you know, fascinating, and also uh, what should I mention? A very friendly conversation I have had. Yeah, uh, I, I absolutely enjoyed yeah, it. I don't know if yeah. time flew. I think it's over two hours. Yeah, but I think it's been amazing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah it is yeah, it yeah. is in fact that's actually also the beauty about the of the of talking you know in, yeah. in, uh, it's a slow a conversation without without uh, without yeah. any specific question or an end in mind I, yeah. I like yeah. this actually it's like adda yeah. i would call this a adda adda yeah yeah in fact nice so adda. many of my bengali friends have called this as an adda so yeah, i yeah. I, uh, I think you should rename this that. into an adda <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah this so this this doesn't actually have a form name or anything yeah, so it's yeah, kind of superfluous in that sense it's it's yeah. yeah. So I, I once again thank you a lot for uh, for your uh, couple of hours on a Saturday morning on this uh, on this particular day. I, I am really thankful. Thankful to you. No worries. As I said, it was just a beautiful yeah. adda, and I loved it. Yeah. So thank yeah. you for doing this. Uh, stay well. Stay happy. Yeah. So this is Pratidwani, where we try to humanize science with Dibyendu Nandi. Thank you.